Public Morals, new show on TNT, Tuesday nights, Ed Burns. Hey guys. So, Thank you very much congratulations. Coming. Thank you. Um, there's something uh, ironic about the fact that one of the most cinematic things you've ever done is on TV. Yeah. How do you feel about that? You know, I spent 20 years making low-budget and micro-budget independent films, and if you make indie films, then you know sort of uh, the law of the land is compromise. Um, you never have enough money, you never have enough time, you're always being told every day on set, you've got to make your day. Um, so typically what ends up happening is it's about capturing a performance more so than uh, trying to create your story visually. A lot of times you have to put that uh, on the back burner and wait for the opportunity to get a little more money. This project was uh, something I had been, a version of this was something I had been dreaming about making for 18 years. Uh, when we finally got the, the pilot greenlit, I sat down with my director of photography, a guy named Will Rexer, who shot all my movies, uh, my costume designer, Kat Thomas, who's done a bunch of my films, and uh, Dina Goldman, my production designer, who I've done a bunch of films with. And we sat down and we looked at it like, all right, this is our shot. You know, we've all worked together making low budget movies. Now, granted, the budget for a TV show is considerably larger than an indie film. It is not what you get to make a studio feature film. Um, but we know how to not waste money. Um, and we know how to take what we're given and put it up on screen. So we said, all right, let's, let's go for it on this one. Um, and that's what we tried to do. So you get this idea, you get this opportunity. What is it about Muldoon that drove this story for you? Why him? Uh, I was looking to create a character who would be sort of at the center of a couple of different universes that are existing and uh, having a trouble sort of uh, controlling all of them. Um, he's the patriarch of his immediate family um, and he's dealing with a wife that wants to move out of the city and a son who's getting into trouble. But he's also the patriarch of that extended family, which includes his cousin who he's brought on into this plainclothes division. Uh, it also includes his father who's a retired cop who's got some uh, wishes that Muldoon doesn't want to uh, uh, sort of hear or deal with. He then is the patriarch within the office with the younger cops and the older senior cops. And then he's also, in a weird way, the patriarch out on the street with um, the, 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 the gangster element that this division um, had to sort of work with. So with that, I tried to come up with this idea of, well, well, who is the real Muldoon? Is the guy at home who's the family guy who is laying down a certain set of laws? Um, if anybody saw the pilot episode, you know, I'm sort of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to teach my son a lesson on how to behave and which way, which path to take. So is that the real Muldoon? And then the guy on the street, on the cops, is that the performance? Or is the guy in the street the real Muldoon, whose morality, let's say, is uh, he plays within that gray area, or is a right. little bit more suspect. Is that the real guy, and the performance is at home? It's a very interesting piece. I've, I've had the chance to watch the first four episodes. And, um, or get it on the iTunes TV page and buy the first four. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Even better, but what's what's what what I what I felt watching what I've seen so far is it's the show is is an examination of so many different things, and one of them is what it means to be a man at that time <clears throat> of that culture in that family. Um, we define our roles in families and our gender roles and leader roles a bit differently now than we did in the 60s. And, and watching, being, and we're, we're, I'm a little bit older than you, but not much. And I was, I was struck by how so much of what I've seen so far of Muldoon is 
him trying to balance what it means to be a man. Because a good man, a good Irish man, Irish Catholic man, tends to his family. But he also takes care of his family by any means necessary, even if he doesn't necessarily think it's the right thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are the kind of things that um, you really don't think about when you're writing. You know, you, you, uh, that, that's more like a, a, a thematic question. And, uh, you know, a lot of writers have said that, you know, you, you can't sit down and think about theme when you're writing. Writing needs to uh, reveal itself during the course of the writing process. So, you know, the goal really is to sit down and tell a, an engaging, entertaining story. And I was pulling from a number of different um, obsessions that I've had, uh, some lifelong obsessions. You know, we talked earlier today on the radio show about um, you know, my, my love of New York City, New York City history, uh, more specifically Hell's Kitchen and uh, uh, sort of the Irish immigrant experience and then the Irish American experience in Hell's Kitchen as it related to not only the gangsters, but also the NYPD, going back to Tammany Hall all the way up until when our story takes place. So, um, you know, and then I'm drawing from my experiences of what it was like to grow up in cop culture, when your dad is a cop, your uncle's a cop, first cousins are cops, and every holiday, you know, is a cop event. You know, you go to the holy name communion breakfast. You know, St. Patrick's Day is a very different kind of day. Um, and so all these things, you know, you're pulling into the story and, you know, for me, I outline and, and I have this epic Bible of all the different things that one day I would hope to put into this series. And I draw from that and you kind of create the story and you tell the story. And then at some point, you know, this theme that you've presented, which I, I quite honestly, I, that wasn't something I thought about as I was writing, but it obviously revealed itself. Um, so do you then find that the characters raise their hands and present themselves to you? How do, who are these people? You know, uh, some of them are composites of people that um, I know. You know, I mean, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I have a friend, let's say, who's got uh, sort of a very sort of interesting, specific personality, maybe a way of speaking, a funny way of delivering lines. And I'll tap into a little bit of that and borrow that voice let's say for uh, Wa Stevens's character, Latucci. And that's one version of it. But then right. I show up and uh, Was has an idea of what to do with that character and he's bringing his experiences to it. And I think the good filmmaker embraces that collaboration and says, okay, well, I kind of thought it was a little more of this and you think it's a little more of that. You know, let's, let's play and figure that thing out. Um, so as much as, uh, I know these characters very well, and I've, I've created this world. Um, I was lucky that I got to make a show in New York. I get to hire these great, well-known actors like Brian Dennehy and Michael Rappaport and Kevin Corrigan, but all of these other great, young, hungry actors. And I then hand the characters over to them. And then they start to tell me who those characters are. And then after you shoot two or three episodes, I spent my time rewriting these scripts writing towards, you know, maybe what I thought were the actor's strengths, but also what I got excited about watching them do. Uh, there's an actor in this uh, show called uh, Duffy, um, uh, played by Keith Nobbs. And Keith was a guy that came in and just every day he kind of added these little quirks to the character. And the more I saw that, I, I found myself rewriting his dialogue, playing into his delivery. Um, uh, you know, there's a, I, I may have told you earlier, there's an actor also, um, a guy named Aaron Dean Eisenberg, who shows up in episode three. He came in to audition to play one of the cops. We ended up not casting him, but I just, I, I love this kid's presence. So I was like, all right, I got a tiny part of this gangster, but this kid is special. So I'm going to flesh out that part um, for him. But, you know, again, it was a small part. And after maybe two or three episodes, when I started to see what he could do, that part just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I started to write towards, you know, again, what I, what I not even his strengths, what I enjoyed watching him do. How do you do that? Let me, let me, ref let me, in order to go to the point where you're casting these actors and you're having visions for who could do what and where they could land, you have to be at least somewhat married to a vision, 
to people, to their words. Where do you find the flexibility after you have made such a commitment creatively? Again, it comes from making indie movies. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many times when you're making a movie where you're, you're not paying people or you're paying them very little, you get the phone call late on a Tuesday night from an actor who's supposed to be working on Wednesday and they say, look, I, I can't make it. You know, I, I got a better gig. Um, and then all of a sudden you have to rethink the scenes you're gonna shoot tomorrow and figure out, all right, I have to write this actor or this character out of a scene or write somebody else into a scene. Um, so just being, you know, learning how to be nimble maybe uh, served me and my entire crew well in, in making this. That said, on a television show like this, you know, when you sign up, we, we've got you. You can't take right, that other course. gig. You know, um, but you're still talking about, if you're talking about rewrites and, and such, that's a, that's a flexibility but that a lot of writers don't seem to have. Yeah, and you don't rewrite sort of plot points. Right. What you're doing is sort of, all right, I know in episode three we start here, we end here, and the audience needs to get these bits of information. Okay. But in between there, how I get from point A to B, uh, I can tell that story 20 different ways. Those two actors can, you know, I, they, they, you know, she can walk into the room, they start the fight, and she walks out of the room, uh, and that relationship is over, let's say, there's a hundred different ways you could write that scene. So depending on the scene, the actors, where we are in the production, there might be moments where I was like, all right, given he does that really well, uh, and she, let's say, doesn't do that other thing as well, let me rework this scene to suit their strengths, as long as it's still serving the story. That said, there are definitely days where it's just like, um, you know, you, you don't do that. It, everything kind of lines up. And, um, you know, I'd say that that's more the norm. Right. Then you're, you know, you're not, I'm not on set rewriting incessantly. Um, but when, when you see some magic, you want to try and capture it. It's an interesting process because we've talked a number of times in the past. And one of the things I, I re really respect about your work is your love of language your your sense of rhythm you you write with the the mentality from my point of view of a musician uh, everything is everything has a tempo a, a melody um, and so just to follow this this uh, thread a little bit longer what happens when you're completely blown away by something that you didn't anticipate you have spent a lot of time crafting the melody of that character, how hard is it to redraft that melody? Because we're not just saying he walks to the street. Yeah. If you watch the show Public Morals, if you watch anything that Ed Burns is watching, you watch it closely and you listen. I always say, sometimes you need to like close your eyes and listen. It's very much like listening to a band at a gig, especially this show. It's like going to like a punk rock show. It's crashing all over the place. It's awesome. What do you do? Well, I think it's, uh, it's like, let's say, you know, if you, if you were in a band, you're going to try and find those musicians that play your tunes well. Uh, that's kind of the same thing, I think. You know, you're trying to find the people that can, you know, sing those melodies that you've written. That said, sometimes they don't. You know, uh, not everything I write, um, let's say, sings. So a lot of times you'll be on set and it, you, know, you can hear it just isn't working. It doesn't sound the way people speak or it just it doesn't have the right flow. And nine times out of 10, that is not the fault of the actor, but it's the, the fault of what I've written. So that's the moment when you have to sit down with the actor and say, all right, like, how, uh, this isn't working. All right, well, what can we do here? And you, you play with it and you try and rewrite it. And sometimes you know, I come up with the solution, but a lot of times um, they come up with the solution. So it's just a matter of, Again, I think you just have to be open to collaborating with your team and, and also recognizing when it doesn't work, uh, they're there to help you. It's also uh, true from uh, a production standpoint. A lot of times, you know, you'll have the idea for that shot uh, that you think would be, oh, this is gonna be fantastic. And you, you know, you, I'll discuss it with Will, the DP, and, and you know, the, the guys in the camera department, and we'll try it and just, it just isn't, something's amiss. And you keep tweaking and you keep tweaking. So that's, you know, that, that's how film sets should work. Um, I got lucky, you know, um, the first film I act in that isn't one of my own movies is Saving Private Ryan. 
And Steven is one of the great collaborators. Great collaborator with his, his crew and with his cast. And I got to watch him and Hanks work out some things. And I got to sort of sit on the sideline there and watch that and say, oh yeah, that's, that, that's a better approach than you know, what I thought, think I was doing as a young filmmaker where I thought, oh, I'm the director. I'm just supposed to be giving directing, uh, direction all the time. Very interesting. So we're kind of taking apart this, uh, the process of putting together public morals. Let's have a look at a scene from the show. You can get an idea of where, where, where it's all coming from. So two things collided in my mind just as we were watching that. First of all, what is it like to see an actor as accomplished as Brian Dennehy breathing your words? Yeah. What uh, is that like? That's one of the first scenes, it's one of the first scenes we shot on Brian's first day. Um, so, I mean, you get a sense of the power that he has. Incredible. You kind of sit back behind the monitor and you kind of can't believe it. You can't believe that he agreed to do it. You can't believe, like, I didn't have this idea that he was off the boat Irish and, and uh, speaking with the brogue. Brian said, hey, I got this idea. Would you be okay with that? And it's Brian Denny. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's like, go with it. Let's run with it. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to the point of a sort of rhythm and collaboration, yeah. Brian is really one of the few actors, like, because he has these epic sort of mini uh, monologues within the show. Um, and he kept... Uh, you know, Brian's obviously older than I am. He knows that sort of, that, that older sort of um, uh, Irish-American or, or Irish-New York world more intimately than I do. So he said, would you mind if I change this word to gobshite and this? And he threw in some of these old Gaelic phrases. Um, and I was like, absolutely, let's do it. Um, so that, that, that's, you know, that's the, the, the key is hire people um, that is so good that they really don't need direction. You know, those, those four actors in that scene, um, uh, Neil and Fred uh, uh, and Ray, who plays Monk, Brian Denny's bodyguard, who he's called Monk because he doesn't speak at all during the whole series until the finale. Um, he speaks in the finale. He speaks in the finale. We had a funny thing with that, I'll tell you a story. So, and then I'll get to some of the other stuff. So, Monk is... Dennehy's right-hand man. He's the silent assassin. And he's, he's with Dennehy all the way, and Dennehy talks to him, and he never speaks. And talking about having to change things, you know, after you've plotted out the world. We're getting, we're in pre-production for the finale, and my producing partner, Aaron Lubin, says, you know, Monk the assassin, uh, it's kind of like Chekhov had, had said this thing, you can't show the gun and not use the gun. And he's like, Monk is the gun. He's the assassin and he hasn't killed anyone yet. You know, we've got to figure this out. So uh, th uh, there was a character who was going to survive season one, and because Monk needed to kill someone, <laughs> uh, Monk had to do what he wow. does. But the other thing about that that I want to add, it's like I'm watching it, and you kind of, you forget the, you know, it's, it's now become its own thing, and you forget the things that influenced it. So two things that came to mind, you know, today we talked about like Oni Madden, who is like this old time Hell's Kitchen Irish gangster, sort of out of prohibition into the 50s. And uh, I think he was nicknamed like the last of the gentleman gangsters. And so Dennehy's whole thing, uh, just the idea of gentleman gangsters, I started to think about that character as a guy who fancied himself a little bit more of a businessman and no longer sort of the street thug. And I, as, then I started to think about that and how we were gonna dress him, what his, his apartment was gonna look like. Then all of a sudden we start to think about Don Corleone and The Godfather. So we're like, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe we should be paying homage to The Godfather. So that scene is lit, in, lit very much in the same way that Gordon Willis lit the scenes of, um, you know, of Brando in his library, in his mansion out on Long Island. And then there's a scene later on also in the finale where uh, Denny, he has the powwow with the other Irish mobsters. So of course we looked at the meeting of the five families and we did something where everything that's on the table in The Godfather, the bowl of fruit, the cigars that are presented, we match that. So like for the people, the real cinephiles who wanna look for the little tiny, tiny details, there's all sorts of little Easter eggs like that sprinkled throughout the show. But you know what I love 
about that scene in particular. We also talked earlier on, on my radio show about your uh, a native New York Irish Catholic boy. I'm a native New York Italian Catholic boy. And I'm an Arthur Avenue Italian. You're you know, from a Hell's Kitchen cop family. The subtle differences between that Irish guy and the Italian guys that we've seen portrayed, yeah. subtle but huge. Yeah. And to, to find a way to illustrate the differences without like flashing a neon sign, it's very, very powerful, very, very nicely drawn. What I wanna ask you though, that also came to mind as we were watching that scene, is I was struck by the confidence of everybody, including you, in the way the scene was shot and staged. Nobody moves, and to me, that's swagger, because the, the fear is that, who wants to watch three dudes sitting on a couch talking? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's like, like we were talking before about, you know, music and it being musical, you know, a film has a certain rhythm, you know, so as you look at that script, you know, you're, you, are, you are playing with those rhythms. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in the show, and you probably got a sense of it from the trailer, is, you know, I, I talked about the influence of Coppola, but Scorsese, a big influence. And, you know, we have, that camera dances all through this show. But there are moments where, you know, that, that can't be the visual language of the entire show. You know, you need to pick your spots to, after one of those moments, pick a spot for the thing to breathe. Um, not have it just be about, hey, take a look at how we recreated the 1960s, or take a look at you know, how great our Steadicam operator is, and we can do a, you know, a three minute scene in one continuous take. You know, there are times where you just have to say, you know, go more Sidney Lumet. Let's create a beautiful composition, sit tight, and let those compositions talk about the power dynamic that's going on in that room. Um, you know, you talked before about the, the, definitions of sort of uh, manhood. Mm -hmm. One of the themes early on that presented itself that I did embrace and started to play with was, uh, was the sense of father-son relationships. You know, in the pilot, I have that scene with my sons. You know, Muldoon, my character, has two sons. Uh, you know, Joe Patton is sitting here dressing down his middle-aged son very much in the same manner that an episode before you saw me dress down my 13-year-old son and playing with those kind of, you know, let's say, uh, paral parallel stories. And we do, we do a bit of that throughout the series. How do, you, how do you measure paying tribute to your influences and making sure that it doesn't become just a love letter? That what we leave is the understanding that you've done your homework, but this is all you. That this is a this is your vision with the information of Scorsese, Spielberg, Lumet, and all the others. I mean, I think it's uh, I I think because you know the the most important thing with any film or in this case a television series is the writing, um, and you know the the writing comes from my obsessions, my. Uh, history, my research, um, and you know the the writing. I I, I don't want to say is like devoid of inspiration, but it is. Uh, it, it doesn't come from the same place. I don't look at an old movie and say oh, I want to write a scene like that. You know the the writing. I I started as a writer, thought I wanted to be a novelist. That's the thing that I I, I have the most confidence in myself that I know how to tell a story. I know how to tell it authentically, and I know it has a very uh, specific and individual point of view. Um, where, uh, let's say, I don't have as much confidence is probably in sort of visual storytelling. And we talked before about being an indie filmmaker, never really having the opportunity to do that. Um, so like, you know, all filmmakers that have come before me, you know, you listen to Scorsese talk and he's constantly referencing, you know, the, the films that um, to this day still inspire him and, uh, 
um, and and uh, influence you know his work and his visual style. And, you know, so that that's you know like we just looked at that as the, the, those things being passed on. The fact that we're a television show and not a film, we we did some other things that if this was a movie, we absolutely would not have. Um, recreated, like we recreated some sets, little minor touches from, uh, you know, a great old movie like The Hustler. I told you earlier, right. like we, we, we recreated the Ames's pool hall, which used to exist in Times Square. And we freeze, we did freeze frames of uh, that pool hall and we'd blow them up and look at the details behind Jackie Gleason, you know, the trophy case, the water cooler, the signage on the wall. And we did those kind of little touches within the show as like, hey, this is a television show. It's not a film, but the films are the things that, it, that influenced us and made us want to tell stories in the first place. So let's like pay homage to them in this different medium. So we felt like we had a little bit more of a green light given it's a television show to have some fun with that. Well, I want to talk more about the, that, the, the, all of the visual aspects in the sets, but I want to show you, all of you one more scene from Public Moral. Shall we hit that? Good stuff, y'all. Good, good stuff. So, um, I gotta tell a story about that scene. Please. Yeah, so you, please. you pulled from your family's history. Yeah. My father's father, the Mr. O, the Tim Hutton character, is loosely based on him in that he, my grandfather was a total be piece of shit who beat the shit out of my grandmother and his kids. And when he died, when I'm a kid, I still remember my father saying, thank God he's gone. And that was always something that my dad was always talking about, like, good riddance. And if anybody knows, you know, the first scene in Brothers McMullen, the brothers toast to that piece of shit father who beat the crap out of them and they pissed on his grave and all that. So clearly that's a little part of my family's history that 20 years later now has worked itself into yet another tale. And see, that's what I wanted to ask you about, which is, because you have such, um, such a love for history, for your family's history, for the history of your people, for lack of a better way to put it, were you ever tempted to pull back? Because what I've seen, pretty harsh. Even uh, Muldoon is sometimes a dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, quite honestly, there, I've, I've cited two examples that I've pulled from my life, and there aren't really too many more. Um, but just uh, the know, people in general. You know, there are some people who we are in such a PC world right now. Someone is bound to say, you could have been nicer. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, well, that, that was part of the thing that attracted me to the idea of doing a period show, that you got to play with sort of uh, when folks were just a little different. You know, we didn't have to play by today's rules. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was fun about creating the world was not only playing with sort of all this sort of New York City folklore, but being able to play and have some fun with sort of these, these, these New York City, let's say, archetypes, whether it's, you know, the, the Hell's Kitchen roughneck gangsters or, you know, in episode uh, 105 when we introduced the Italian wise guys um, or, you know, the, the wise ass cops and, and those types of characters. So um, just it was just as a writer having fun with it. But I never really uh, I, I was never concerned with ha have I gone too far or do I need to pull back? Um, this city has uh, proven to be a major playground for you in making this show. Where did you find the most joy in, in creating some of the scenes, some of the set pieces? Uh, you know, I mean, a couple of days come to mind that um, it just kind of blew me away. You know, like we would location scout and, you know, you'd find a street in the West Village or in Chelsea uh, where, you know, the buildings hadn't been power washed. They still had wooden doors, wrought iron gates. And we we're like, okay, this is great. We're gonna use those four buildings on that side of the street, make sure we don't see that new glass tower there. And then on the other side of the street, we'll use these five or six buildings in a row. And you know, you get out of the van in the morning and you, you've spoken to everybody on the team about where we're gonna shoot and what we wanna do. But there's nothing like showing up on the set and there are 
50 period cars on Jane Street. And all of the modern signs have been pulled off and replaced to look like the early 1960s. And you've got 100 extras on the streets dressed in the period clothes. And it's literally, you step onto that street that you've walked down a thousand times in your life, and now you are transported back in time. I mean, I always, you know, um, living here for so long, probably like a lot of people, you know, you walk down a street and you think, oh man, what, what was this? What was this block like, you know, sure. right after World War II, you know, or uh, you, like I live in Tribeca and you see, look up at the buildings and it says when they were built, 1881, 1885, and I think, man, what did it look like then? And in some way, that's been a lot of the fun of the show is to being able to sort of fulfill some of those fantasies about what did it look like then? And it's also, you know, it's everything from Gritty Hell's Kitchen to um, shooting outside uh, the Waldorf Astoria to we shot a, a hotel scene um, on uh, Central Park South. And this is kind of like ha me as an indie filmmaker having to, let's say, uh, unlearn. Is that right? Unlearn? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, some, some things that I was used to. Like we had this scene where there was a walk and talk when me and my wife leave the Russian tea room. And we, I surprised her by taking her to a hotel on Central Park South. And typically the way we would have shot that was, you know, it would be a, we'd lay down some track and it would be a dolly shot and you'd see me and Elizabeth Masucci, who plays my wife, you know, walking and talking like that. But, you know, we have Central Park South closed down. We have cars all over the street from the 1960s. And we have a Luma Crane. Um, and, you know, the, the street is lit all the way from 7th Avenue all the way past the plaza to 5th Avenue. And my DP says, well, we got all the toys and we got all the lights. Like, let's not do a simple walk and talk. Let's show this off. So we were, you know, and that, that I had to learn because I'm used to got to make the day, got to get the shot, just yeah. get the scene, get the performance. And instead, I had to slowly learn, oh, wait, we have toys and we have time. So let's really sell this thing. And that was episode 103. And then from that moment on, I can just see the visual language of the exterior scenes, uh, uh, especially, start to change. And we start to pull that camera back and show a little bit more of old New York. And then the other thing that was great was discovering how much you could erase digitally after the fact. Um, Amazing. Uh, so, we're already, you know, we haven't been picked up for season two yet, but we're already discussing um, how we really want to blow your mind in season two and taking you back wow. onto the streets. So we have, with the time we have left, we want to give you guys a chance to ask some questions of Ed Vern. So while you raise your hands and make yourselves known to our trusty folks here, I want to ask you another question. Did you um, ever bring your family down to set? Oh, yeah, all the time. What were they like? I, you know, they, it's, were they, were they, I mean, I'm thinking like your dad, did he look around? First of all, did he give it the thumbs up? Oh yeah, like when he came to the sets, you know, and we had the old squad room, um, you know, him and some other uh, cops who were friends of the show came by who were like the old timers long since retired. And you know, like that, that old squad room and the cigar smoke, um, they said it was immediately like going back in town. Spot on. But then even just, you know, like in some of the old bars and restaurants, like the Old Town and Walker's where we shot, when we came in and, and brought those back to the early 60s, uh, some folks, you know, that was, that's their regular spot. They came in and they did a weird, like, like time warp. So that had to be yeah, it was fun. awesome. All right, who has a question? How you doing? Um, hey. Thank you for being here. Um, what inspires you every day to get up and write? I mean, it's, it looks visually amazing, but... What, what, I mean, some people read the artist way and they go through that, like, you know, every day you spill out the diary of your mind or whatever. So what is, what is going through your mind when you're writing wherever you write, you know, yeah. and uh, think about those yeah. ideas, you know? I, you know, the, the, my writing process has changed since I started with Brothers McMullen. You know, with McMullen, I had a full-time job and I had to write at night or, you know, write, uh, just find the time on the weekends and, um, you know, quite honestly, it was tough to stay disciplined because you only had so many free hours in every week to get the work done. Um, after that, as a young guy, before I had kids, I could write any, you know, I used to like to write late at night. Um, 
Uh, once I had my kids, I had to become very disciplined because you don't have nearly as much time. And you know, so for the last 11 years, uh, I've been on a pretty strict schedule every day of, uh, you know, by 10 o'clock, I turn the Wi-Fi off, I got a nice large cup of black coffee, and I know from 10 to 1, I am writing no matter what. I don't care how terrible it is. I just, I will keep moving. And I know from my, my own history and from speaking to a lot of friends of mine who are writers and also going to film schools, that what tends to happen is you get paralyzed because you think that scene needs to be perfect before you can move on. You think you need that absolute right line to end the scene before you go. And, and I was that way. And I don't remember where I got the advice, but now I do it. And I've equated it to uh, someone maybe who, let's say, is a songwriter. Um, you know, you're going to pick up your guitar and you're gonna, or the piano and you're going to noodle around and play until you find the thing. You're not going to stay stuck on that G chord because you don't know what chord to go to next. You noodle and you play and you have your tape recorder going and then when you listen to it the next day, you're like, oh, there was some, actually some, a good little melody in there. Let me expand on that. I've done that now with the writing. Like, I, I, de I absolutely outline, so I have a little bit of a road map of where I'm going. That said, if I stray off the road map, and you know, like that thing that happens when you get into the groove and your subconscious mind takes over, you have to embrace that and go with that. If you're writing a feature, we only have 90 minutes or two hours to tell the story, sometimes, you know, that detour is a disaster, and you're like, wait a second, there's no way for me to get back to the story of my singular hero who's gonna go do whatever. With a, a big ensemble like this, I didn't have to be as disciplined with that because I could go off. You know, like the scene we just saw between Deidre and O'Bannon. Um, that wasn't in my outline, but I, I went into that direction and I was like, oh, okay, where am I going with these two? And then I did not, what I then did was, I didn't write the next scene in the screenplay I wrote the next scene in their story, and then the next scene in their story, and the next scene in their story, and then went back to what I had written for this episode and say, all right, I have four additional scenes that I didn't anticipate writing. Where can I work them into this episode? So it's a little different, the feature writing to the series writing, but that's kind of how I do it. And then the, oh, and then the other part is, then I have lunch at one o'clock. Uh, walkers, right on my corner. Um, and then I go back upstairs and then I reread what I wrote. And, uh, you know, it's, and, and also think, don't be so critical of your stuff. Like, it's not supposed to be perfect the first time out. And if it's complete dog shit, who cares? You don't have to show it to anyone. But you'll be very surprised that it isn't. And there's actually some good stuff in there. And you're going to say to yourself, oh, actually, I'm a pretty good writer. Let me continue with this. And that tends to happen more times than not. Hi, Ed. Hey. Uh, thanks for uh, doing this show. Yeah. I'm a fellow Woodsider. Oh, nice. All so right. uh, I figured I'd come down and lend some support. Now, that period of history that you do the show in the mid 60s for the NYPD, that's really, really colorful. Is that going to be working a lot of that history, going to be working its way into the storyline? or? You know, we set the, we, we never identify what year the show takes place in. We're, we're saying sort of early 1960s. Um, because Mad Men, which is one of my favorite shows, did such a great job at identifying exactly where you were. You know, they, they really went event to event. And we knew, like, all right, we don't want to compete with that. The other thought I had when I started to write the piece was there were moments where it started to feel like a Western. You know, the West Side uh, of New York, you know, like, I'm pulling from... Uh, let's say, a uh, hundred years of New York City history. Uh, you know, West Side history, NYPD history, and just, you know, like, great old gangster stories from Prohibition era. And I was just like, all right, that's, that's a phenomenal true story. How can I repurpose that? I mentioned, like, Oni Madden. Like, all right, he, that, that type of character didn't exist in Hell's Kitchen in the 60s, but I'm not making a historical document here. I'm, this is pure fiction, so let me take that guy and move him 20 years into the future. But the, some things started to play out, and we were talking about the final scene of episode 103 that you just watched. That's like a Western. So I started to think, well, all right. If you think about Westerns, they never identify what year. You know, you're in the Old West. I mean, sometimes you do, but typically you're somewhere between 1840 and the turn of the century. And we kind of embraced that. And then that also kind of gave us the green light 
to, as I said before, like pulls from some New York City folklore and kind of move it to this era, even though it didn't take place maybe in the 1960s. Um, uh, but as an old retired cop told us, hey, it's New York City. Whatever you can imagine, it happened. Or it's happening right now, so just run with it. Um, but it also kind of gave us a little freedom to get away with, all right, we found a car that's 1966, and we found a car from 1962. The car from 62 doesn't run. The car from 66 runs. All right, we're using the car from 66, even though the show takes place before 1966. Um, so we gave ourselves a little bit of creative leeway there uh, to play with it. Hey, Ed, how are you? Good. Um, you briefly answered my question earlier. I was going to ask, um, when you talked about your father and the uh, other ex-police officers, what was their response to the authenticity and, and, and looking back? Would they just take it back and thought it was just amazing and uh, yeah, brought I it mean, right like, back to where they were at? Uh, yeah, I haven't gotten too much feedback yet. You know, um, my dad definitely helped me with sort of the, uh, the vernacular and how the cops... And quite honestly, you know, all the characters spoke then, you know, even stuff with, um, you know, between me and my wife in the show, my, you know, my parents would read the scripts and my mother was like, you are so full of shit. She would never say this. She would say it like that. I never let your father get away with that. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, so they did. But then there was also stuff like, you know, I, I, in the pilot, there's the scene where the young cop comes into the public morals division and he first meets with uh, the captain and then he meets with the lieutenant and then he goes out for the day with, um, with one of the guys. And I, I forget exactly what I had wrong, but basically how the captain would talk to the kid, uh, my dad said, would be very different than uh, sort of than how the lieutenant would talk to him, you know? And then even when the lieutenant and the captain would talk afterwards, the dynamic would be more like this. It wasn't like that. So it was really tr trying to get some guidance with that kind of stuff. And then the, the other big thing that we heard from, you know, a lot of uh, old cops that we talked to is just, you know, the show takes a look at, the public morals dealt with um, sort of nonviolent crimes or what they called victimless or nuisance crimes. Gambling, prostitution, anything to do with the liquor laws. Um, and, you know, we heard these stories and also just in some of the research of these old memoirs that I read, you know, they would talk about like the difficulty of making an arrest with a prostitute and a john. You know, nobody wanted to lock up the prostitutes. Nobody wanted to lock up the johns. But, you know, there was a certain quota that had to be filled. So when, you, when did you make the call? Um, and who would you let go? Uh, talked about, um, you know, like a fight in the bar. All right. Two guys are going to get locked up for fighting in the bar. And if they, if they write up that the fight took place in the bar, then the bar owner might lose his liquor license. So the bar owner says, hey, would you mind moving the fight outside into the street into your report? All right, well, if I do that, uh, you know, you're putting me in a tricky spot. So we hear those kind of stories over these, you know, like someone said, they, they're not um, crimes, they're sins. So how do, you, how do you make those calls? So when I heard that, I was like, all right, that's, that's interesting. And then I just started to kind of create these types of scenarios to put these cops in those situations where all right, do I, do I let this guy go for this minor thing? Or on this day, do I have to take him? Um, so that was... Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that scene with the newbie, uh, the plainclothes guy, because I think that was one of my favorite scenes with uh, okay. uh, Bob Nepper, and then he goes to uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson and out on the street with you and uh, Was Stevens. And that whole sequence was so amazing. And one thing I wanted to ask you was, particularly, I mean, the great actors, uh, yeah. Bob Nepper and... Going into uh, the scene with Ruben, the lieutenant, did you write it in that rapid fire? We work from ta 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 and then also with the guy who comes out with the prostitute on the stairwell where he has that stutter. Was it? Was, yeah. But that what you wrote into it? Or did those actors bring that sort of uh, uh, cadence to it? No, it's kind of like what we're talking about. Like, you know, like Ruben, um, that speech that he, found, he has, I found this old um, police manual from the 1950s, and it it described the public morals division, all those crimes that they have to do, all kinds of vice, Ruben's speeches. Um, uh, so I just kind of uh, rewrote it, but listing all that stuff, and, and it was a chunk. And Ruben had this idea where he said, hey, 
you know, so he asked me, where'd you get this? I said, oh, it's, it's in this book. He goes, oh, well, let me use the book. And he said, well, maybe I can do something where I, like, I pick it up as if I'm going to read it, but then I close it, and then I just roll with that thing. And I was like, I love it. Great. Um, so that's what he did. So, yeah, no, it's, it's I, I, again, I said it before, but you're always better off if you're a filmmaker to embrace your actors and, you know, give them room to do their thing. Because then what happens is they're happy to be there. And then they just bring their A game. And that's, you know, across the board, that's what we just kept getting. Hi. Hey. Huge fan. Um, you, now that you had a taste for the toys as a filmmaker, can you see yourself going back to the indie world? And, or do you say to yourself, I would love to shoot Brothers McMullen's sequel on, with all the toys? Uh, there's, yeah, there's, a, yeah, there's a little bit of the indie thing where I feel like been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. um, in a perfect world, uh, I get to do this for five or six seasons. I mean, this is really, I had so much fun. And all those people that, you know, like, believed in me and worked for no money, or very little money, you know, my, my crew, I was able to hire everybody back. And everybody got paid and got paid for 10 episodes. Um, uh, and all of those actors over the years who have gone and done my little no-budget movies, as you watch this season, you'll start to see, you know, some of those familiar faces. Um, and next season, I'm writing in even more of them. Um, so, th th I mean, this has been, I had so much fun doing it. When you guys see the episodes, you'll see, like, all right, this guy clearly was loving life when he was making this show. Um, so, but at the end of the run, um, I do want to one day, I have this idea, not for a sequel to Brothers McMullen, but a prequel. I had three ideas for feature films. Uh, one was, you know, I wanted to do sort of a look at what it was like to go to high school in the 80s when I went to high school. I wanted to do a movie about what it was like to be um, an eighth grader in a strict Catholic school. Um, and then, you know, what it was like to be, you know, the kid in college who's trying to figure out, you know, sort of like, let's say, a graduate style romantic comedy, the guy who's just graduated from college. So those are, let's say, three movies I wanted to make. And then I thought, oh, well, why don't I just make, put all that into the prequel for McMullen? So the oldest brother is getting out of college, and he meets Connie Britton, the young, you know, we'll find the, the next Connie Britton. My character is the, the um, my, my high school story. And McGlone's character, Patrick, is the kid dealing with Catholicism in the eighth grade in a Catholic school. So I wrote probably half of that script. Um, maybe five, six years from now, I'll finally finish it. All right. But the good thing is we won't, I, I didn't want to do a sequel because we'll all be looking crazy and old. <laughs> it would just be too bizarre. <laughs> you know? Well, the show again is called Public Morals. It's on TNT Tuesday nights. Watch it. At on iTunes. Thank you, guys.